Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Great. So you are an MA with an LPC. Yes, I am. I'm proud of it. And I am a PsyD with an LPC. Mm -hmm. And we know lots of people who are LCSWs. We yeah. know a couple of MDs. I even know a DO. I'm lost already. Yeah. So, it's uh, alphabet soup. It is alphabet soup. It's yeah. crazy um, how many different kinds of distinctions that there are when you talk about people getting credentialed to go out and work with people in the helping professions. And one of the things that I hear a lot from students for sure, but also from clients is that they have no idea what the difference with those distinctions are. So and, I, and they don't care, and there's no reason they should care. Most of those are distinctions in, in pursuit of the restriction of trade. Yes. So it matters to whether or not your insurance company will pay for this credential. And nobody cares anything beyond that. Well, did, or, and are you competent? Mm -hmm. and do you present yourself confidently? Do you know what you're doing? Are you going to be able to help me? But will my insurance pay if I come and see you? Right. So that's the question. And, and that's all about restriction of trade. And all of these different organizations, all of these different credentialed uh, identifications have their own governing bodies. And those governing bodies all fight for a piece of the pie. Right. You know, this may be actually become more relevant if we move closer to single payer health care. Right. Um, then right. these kinds of well, things may actually. Go back and think about the battles that we had about TRICARE. Yeah. You know, the, the government of the United States exploded in terms of its investment in military adventurism around the world. And we had all these veterans coming back from multiple deployments who needed emotional uh, support. And they had TRICARE as their insurance uh, provider. And for years, TRICARE would not accept uh, LPCs. Mm -hmm. You don't have the right credential. You don't have the right qualification. But they would take LCSWs. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that that existed was that LCSWs had better lobbyists than LPCs did. Mm -hmm. so, so before we get on to the, our own political <laughs> uh, high horses, first let's Are think you about... you saying that just what I was doing? Am I saying that's what you were doing? Yeah. I'm saying that that is where we will inevitably go because we both have very strong opinions about this. But uh, the first thing would be to start to define what some of these different uh, identifications mean. So first off, let's just start with you're an MA and I'm an PsyD. What does that mean? It means I have a secondary college degree. I have a Bachelor of Arts uh, in Political Science, and I have a Master of Arts in Counseling. And I have a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, a Master of Arts in Counseling, and a Doctorate in Clinical Psychology. Right. And so what happens is that a person lists their highest achieved degree in a particular discipline when they identify themselves professionally. Right. So when you see BA or MA or PhD. So PhD means piled higher and deeper. How does that compare to PsyD? <laughs> so that means doctor of philosophy. And originally uh, there were only PhDs. Hmm. So the original terminal degree in every field was a doctorate of philosophy. So it didn't matter whether you were studying art or you were studying psychology or you were studying even medicine in the early days, you got a PhD. A doctorate of philosophy was the highest degree that was awarded. Now, after that, um, there started to become distinctions, most notably because some 300 years ago, medical doctors wanted to start to identify themselves as different. Mm. And so they started to award a specific doctorate in medicine called an MD, which is a doctor of medicine. Okay. And so a PhD and a PsyD are different, not at all. 
except that some years ago, about 15 years ago, the APA, the American Psychological Association, wanted to have a degree that identified people in under their uh, governance differently than PhDs, and so they started the Doctor of Psychology degree. Right, and then the labor organization for psychologists got control of the admissions process and you couldn't become and, and and lobbied the states for licensure laws so that you couldn't become a licensed psychologist unless you had graduated from an APA approved clinical program. Correct. So then PsyD started saying, well, well no, wait a minute, we can we can do the same thing. We can set ourselves up with a slightly different credential, but with almost exactly the same education and we can go to the state legislatures and say well, how about giving us a license because we have all these credentials and the state legislature said well how much money are you willing to give us to set that up for you so that you can make money and I don't know the answer to that question but they were successful mm -hmm. and so now you can have a PsyD and go out and be a psychologist mm -hmm. although I think it's a reserved term clinical psychologist is a reserved term for graduates of APA programs or am I no, wrong? No, clinical psychologist is a reserved term for anyone who has a degree Either of those licenses. from an accredited university. It's uh -huh. not controlled by the APA. Licensed psychologist is controlled by the APA. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's what I mean. These distinctions are pedantic, and only people who are in the industry would even care. It's a distinction without a difference. Right. But, yeah. but you know, the truth is that people, you know, hear these things and they're not informed about what they mean and so uh, you know to the extent that people care we're presenting the information and as we go through this um, it, on the YouTube I will be putting up little yeah. uh, plates or little slides that'll have these different titles right. on them that will define them a little bit better um, if you're listening to the podcast for this specific episode you may actually want to go and access the YouTube version, the video version, because there'll be additional information. Well, and then it, but I'll include it in this in the show notes also. Yeah, but the subsets still break down in a confusing array, and I believe that they are all still in service of restriction of trade. Uh, an LSW versus an LCSW. Uh, you can be a licensed social worker. Mm -hmm. You have to be licensed, mm -hmm. which means you have to have graduated from a university program that gives you that credential says hey this person took all these classes and met all the requirements that we have set to be a social worker mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you're clinically qualified mm -hmm. to practice mental health care you there are other things that social workers do so if you want to do clinical work if you want to work with couples and marriage counseling you want to work with depressed people you want to work with people that have anxieties or adhd or whatever then you need to subspecialize at the LSW school mm -hmm. and have uh, practicums and go out and get practice that's supervised working with people in these areas. And then you get to say, I'm an LCSW. Mm -hmm. And for a long time in the St. Louis area, at any rate, because the, the big dog school here is, is Washington University that has George Warren Brown School of Social Work, the hospitals in the area would not hire an LPC. They would only hire LCSWs. Mm -hmm. And so they controlled the market access to the job. Mm -hmm. But then the demand got so large within the community for services that they couldn't provide because they didn't have enough providers mm -hmm. that the, uh, the state of Missouri was convinced to offer a license called an LPC, a licensed professional counselor. Then there was a lot of debate over whether or not you use the term therapist or psychotherapist or mental health counselor mm -hmm. or whatever. And the LPC lobby said, I got to roll it all into the, the only thing you can call yourself is a licensed professional counselor. So that's a mouthful of words. And when mm -hmm. you say that to somebody, they say, well, what, what are you? I said, oh, I'm a licensed professional counselor. They said, what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. And did you do this kind of work? And then now, uh, I started in private practice. I graduated with a master's in counseling, started in private practice before the state of Missouri ever had licensure mm -hmm. for counseling. And I was in business for about five years and they passed a licensure law. So then I had to go back and take the test because I already had the education, mm -hmm. but I had to go back and take the, the test that if I scored high enough on it, the state would say, well, yeah, you, you're licensed and good to go. So I did that. And now I've been a licensed LPC for almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't change anything in terms of my preparation or my training or my qualifications to do the job, but it gave me the ticket so that I could hang out a shingle and the insurance companies would reimburse and you know, I could do the trade, which is what they were trying to control access to. Right. 
So mostly in most states in licensure, which is different from education. So you go to a university and you get an education and that gives you a degree. Right. So the degrees are MA, MSW, so MA, Master of Arts, right. or MSW, some uh, universities give away an MED, which is a right. Master of Education right. My wife has for counseling. Years. Yeah. Um, and then MSW is Master of Social Work. Right. Those master level programs make you eligible for licensure in most states for either the LPC, some states call it the LCPC, uh, which is Illinois does it. Yeah, which is licensed professional clinical, counselor yeah. or licensed clinical professional counselor, or the LCSW, which is licensed clinical social worker. Right. So the degree is from the university, the license is from the state. And the certification, which you get on top of the license, you get certified as a hypnotherapist, you mm -hmm. get certified as a marriage counselor, you get certified as a, uh, an adolescent counselor. I mean, you get certified as a gay counselor. I mean, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. it, every little niche, they try to control access to the market. Mm -hmm. Well, that's done through the professional organizations. Mm -hmm. So I have a license to do practice in mental health counseling in the state of Missouri. Which means I can do marriage counseling, or I can work with little kids, or I can mm -hmm. work with families, or I can, you know. But each of those subsets wants to control access to the market. And so they say, well, are you a certified marriage counselor? Mm -hmm. Are you a certified counselor for adolescents? Meaning, did I take some extra training that they provide, or they say, you, here's two weekends of hypnotherapy training. Right. If you complete it, we'll give you the certification, and you can market yourself as a hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't gotten the certification, there's no legal restriction. Our sex therapist. Right. I can do that. Hey, here I am. I'll tell you all about it. But do I have the certification? Mm -hmm. you know, and that organization of sex therapists wants me to have their certification before I put myself out to the public as somebody who knows about sex therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all in, and, they, and their justification, their definition of why they exist is we are trying to protect the public mm -hmm. from charlatans, mm -hmm. from quacks, from people that don't know what they're doing. And so we're here to certify if you've passed our standards, you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Which in its essence mm -hmm. is probably genuinely and sincerely meant, but in practice probably isn't. I disagree. You, you do. I think it's totally in pursuit mm -hmm. of controlling the access to trade. I think it's a justification that they use. Oh, here, this is why we're doing it. And they put their hand on the Bible and they swear that's true. Yeah. But I don't think that's what it is. Well, I don't know that, that, that people who work in state government know what the difference is between the education. So there are differences in education. Like right. We went to a university and got a master's in counseling and, and we went to a certified university that had met the standards yes. that were set by the government to be able to give that degree. Right. Right. So, so it was because there are fly by yeah. it. Yeah, it's an yeah, accredited yeah, yeah. university, yeah. and there are accrediting systems for universities. Right. Now, here are the hoops you have to jump through. How many credit hours you have to take in counseling? There are eight divisions of courses that you have to have so many hours in each division of those eight uh, categories before you can graduate and say, "I have a master's in counseling." But our education was different than people who went to school for social work. Yeah. It was substantially different. And, right. and, and not only do I know this because I know people who are in the field, but I've taught in both institutions. So I taught in an institution that trained people for MAs to go out and be LPCs, licensed professional counselors. And I've also taught in an institution that trains people to be LCSWs to get I, masters I'm surprised in social work. That. My understanding was that the social workers wouldn't let you teach in their programs unless you had the social work credential. Well, it's a, oh, it's a secret. It's a secret. Okay. So you're not supposed to tell I'm, me. I'm just stuns me that you say that. But uh, the criteria or the 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 uh, substance. You of probably bypass that because you got your ID. Pro well, that so would, that that's a, a corollary. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but. Uh, the substance of the program is different. So when we went to school for our master's in yeah. counseling, we were primarily trained in the delivery of talk therapy. I mean, right. that was the it overwhelming... skill-focused yes. program. Yes. And when you go to school for 
you know, social work, you are specifically trained in the delivery of, of services, services. Yes, yeah. that match people to resources. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't some clinical education that goes into those programs, but the point being that I think it does matter the way people are trained because even if it doesn't change their ability to do clinical practice, it does change their focus whether they are consciously aware of it or not. I would agree. Yeah. And so that's why for me, when I go out and, and, and I talk to people about these different kinds of programs and the different uh, credentials that are associated with them, and I say these things, some people get really angry. Sometimes, so, you know, I've had people who operate in social work programs that say, oh, you shouldn't say that about social workers. And I'm like, well, but that's the truth. And they don't, they don't. That's a secret inside information. Well, but they don't refute that that's the truth. They right. just don't want it to be well advertised right and I think that's wrong so you have the master's level programs and then you have the doctoral level programs so the master's level programs seem to come in two varieties one is training you to have the skills to go out and do the job at a master's level mm -hmm. and one is providing you with the next sequence set of educational yes. standards so that you become eligible for a PhD or PsyD program right because you can't get into a PsyD program until after you've or a PhD program until after you've gotten your master's degree, mm -hmm. and so they they've set that up as a way to control access to the programs that give you the degrees to the programs right that educate you to in, at the doctoral level right yeah um, so. When you get to the doctoral level, then there's a distinction between individuals who can write prescriptions mm -hmm. for psychotropic. So psychotropic medication is any medication that affects the brain. So antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti-anxiety medications, and people who can't. So the individuals who can write prescriptions are either MDs, medical doctors, or DOs, doctors of osteopathy. But that, that's a determination of the state licensure boards. Yes. So you're back to politics again. Back to politics. But then individuals who have PhDs or PsyDs in clinical and psychology. And that varies from state to state. That varies from state to state. So there are 12 states that actually allow prescriptive authority for individuals who have doctorates in clinical psychology and the federal government allows that but most states do not right and so that means that to get a prescription for a medication you have to go specifically to either a medical doctor or a do who is a psychiatrist who has specific training in psychiatry although sometimes you can get those prescriptions also from a general practitioner if they feel comfortable being able to write those prescriptions, but you can also get those prescriptions nowadays from nurse practitioners. Well, uh, within degrees. Uh, they, within they degrees. They can't do uh, controlled substances. They cannot prescribe controlled substances, correct. Oh. But yeah, so, so what's part of what's happening is the economics is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody told me this week that there's only one family health physician in training at WashU this semester. One. They're not going into that. They're specializing mm -hmm. in other things. And so we're going to run out of family practitioners when the current crop retires. Mm -hmm. And over 100 hospitals in rural areas of the United States have closed in the last three years. Right. So states like Missouri, where a number of our rural hospitals have closed, there, there are no service providers in those areas. And so the state is saying, okay, nurse practitioners can mm -hmm. go in and do they can set broken bones they can give more prescriptions they can they can do things on their own authority that doesn't require the immediate supervision of a licensed physician mm -hmm. and that's a response to the change in the marketplace that that drives the bus mm -hmm. and the same thing happens with with mental health counseling you know when when uh missouri passed the law for lpcs to be a legitimate licensure able to do mental health counseling in the script of the law, it says we have the protected right of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Well, that hadn't been tested for years and years and years because nobody ever wanted to take a case to court because they're afraid the courts would then say, oh, that's ridiculous, you, that doesn't hold. Mm -hmm. And then we would lose an, L, an area of marketability because if, if somebody comes in and sits down and says, I, I want to talk to you, but you know, is this just between us? 
right now I can legally say, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. It's protected. And I can't even go into court if your wife wants to divorce you and say, well, what did this guy say? I, I have to say, well, I'm not allowed to say. Mm -hmm. uh, if they take that cover umbrella away from us, then I have to speak right up. Mm -hmm. And so then we have individuals who are trained at the master's level. We have individuals who are trained at the doctoral level. And within those two areas, there are multiple different degrees and licensures that are uh, and available yeah. and certificates. Right. And then you have individuals who have may or may not have any training whatsoever um, and are completely unregulated and are called coaches. Well, they started that way, but they're starting to have well, certification programs. Starting they're to have certification, but it's not licensure. Right. So basically what that means is that anybody who decides that they have some knowledge base can say, I'm a coach, I'm a life coach, I'm a career coach, right. and start providing that service in a completely unregulated fashion. Right. Because they determined that there's a market out there mm -hmm. that's not being addressed. and In some ways, it's not being addressed because of the restrictions that licensure imposes on me as an LPC. Mm -hmm. As an LPC, you come in and you're out of control in the way that you spend your money. You, you can't resist buying new toys. And I am not allowed to say to you, bring in your checkbook, we'll sit down and go over it and we'll balance it and we'll set up a spending plan for you. And we'll, I can't do that. You can't get financial I, advice. I cannot do right. that because it's illegal. Mm -hmm. But as a coach, no, I had that restriction. Right. And right. as an LPC, I. It, worried about your interrelationships with others and, and I say, you know, you need to go on a guy's trip because you don't have any men friends. I can't go with you. Mm -hmm. But as a coach, I say, hey, let's go. We'll get four mm -hmm. or five guys and we'll go on a trip and mm -hmm. we'll all do well and I'll I'll have a couple of meetings and we'll have group talks and mm -hmm. you'll be all better. Mm -hmm. And I might sit around the fire and drink beer with you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which also would not be legal for me to do. Absolutely not. So, it's, so you get into the questions of is it a legal restriction? Mm -hmm. Is it a clinical boundary that, that's required for the safety of the relationship? And what do you call it? Right. So, right. so hopefully this conversation at least sparked some curiosity in people. Um, obviously, this is a topic that is broader than just a 20-minute discussion. But if anybody has any questions about what Brett and I have been discussing today, please get a hold of us um, on the website where the podcast lives, psychwithmike.com. You can contact us through the email there. My direct email address is michaelmahan72 at yahoo.com. And anybody who has any questions can direct those questions to us, and we will try to answer those. Um, please subscribe if you're watching us on the YouTube channel. There is an icon in the bottom right-hand corner. Like the videos and subscribe to the channel. Remember that uh, the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.